Cassidy. Hi, I'm Irene. And today we'll be interviewing Professor Scott McLennan, Department of Geosciences here at Stony Brook University. Okay. So, uh, the first question is, how did you get started in the science field and what piqued your interest in Mars? Uh, okay, so they're, they're, they're quite separated in time. So I got interested in science as a, just as I was entering university. So initially I was going to go into political science and then a friend of mine sort of brought me some Scientific American magazines and I got interested in them and, uh, and decided I'd go into geology. And so that, that got me started as an undergraduate and then um, from there I did my undergraduate in Canada, went on to Australia for a PhD, and then came to Stony Brook after that. It's so. amazing. Was it, was it cool going to different countries to learn? It, well, I'm Canadian originally, okay. so I, I was, I was born Australia. there, so that's where I did my undergraduate. And going to Australia was pretty exciting, but um, uh, I wasn't interested in planetary science at the time, uh, and was more interested, it was the kind of rocks I was interested in, and Australia was a good place to, to look at what's called the Precambrian and the Archean. And so I only I actually only applied to schools in Australia and got accepted to one of them, and there, there I went. And then my PhD supervisor was in fact a planetary scientist, even though I worked on rocks on Earth. He was a planetary scientist and had been involved in the lunar science program. He'd, okay. been, he'd helped set up one of the laboratories in Houston when the Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 samples came back. And so I, you know, it's what I call I learned by osmosis, just because he was interested. I learned fair bit about planetary science and then when uh, the mission started to go to Mars starting with Pathfinder uh, it started to become clear that the stuff I was interested in you could start to apply uh, that to what we were learning about Mars and then as the you know as the Mars program sort of matured and has you know now sent so many missions there that you know we realized that we could start working on that it was interesting so that's what we did. Okay. Um, what is the most interesting thing that you have learned while working with rocks on Mars? I think when we first, when I first started, we thought that we would be able to look at very, you know, have very superficial comparisons with the Earth, and I think that's what most people thought we'd be able to do. We could use our Earth-based experience, but but that 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 in detail things would be very different. And I think the most surprising um, thing has been that early in the history of Mars, the way we look at it is, is almost exactly the same as we would look at Earth. So mm -hmm. I'm interested in sedimentary rocks, I'm interested in layered rocks and trying to understand the history of the Earth and now Mars by looking at those, you know, it's like the, the old saying, it's like, um, it, it's, it's like the pages of a book, you, know, you mm -hmm. just uh, try to do that. And, and I don't think we really expected there to be a record on Mars that was just so complete and so similar the kinds of things we find on Earth. So I think that's the, that's the most surprising thing, is, is that we can apply all of the tools that we use here on Earth to those, to those rocks. Okay. Uh, could you explain what you hope to discover in the future? So I think for, um, at the moment, uh, we're, we're, I'm working on both the um, uh, Opportunity Rover and the Curiosity Rover. And, and with Curiosity, we've, um, we're, we've just started, uh, it, it landed in a very large meteorite crater and it has this, this stack of sedimentary materials that's like five kilometers thick, which is like a, yeah. even on Earth would be a very large yeah. mountain. Yeah. And, and uh, in, in, in that, there's, in that layering, and one of the reasons why we went to that location is there's a change uh, in the nature of the sedimentary materials that we see from orbit. So when we look down from orbit, we can take measurements that tell us generally what kind of minerals we have, what the general nature of the layering is, uh, and it looks like there's a change, and that change may be telling us about how the global environment of Mars changed early in its history, because you know, the idea, the conventional wisdom is that it went from this what's called an early warm and wet period to a much drier uh, and much more arid and sort of uh, barren landscape that we see now and much of that seems to be recorded in those layers and so what we're really interested in doing is going we're just at the base of, of what's called Mount Sharp now and so we're just beginning to, to work our way through that layering so I think all of us are very excited about the thought of of actually confirming or you know, at least mm -hmm. testing those models and seeing you know whether they're right or wrong and if they're if they're wrong whether they need revision or whether they need to be completely rethought that kind of thing mm -hmm. so that's all very exciting. Okay. Um, how has finding evidence to support the past existence of liquid water on Mars influenced your current research? 
So, it, well, it, it influences in many ways because, um, uh, you know, our, our, as our thinking evolves, then of course how we do our research evolves. And so, um, uh, when at one point we thought that much of Mars, uh, at least in the for the rocks that we were looking at, they were influenced by very acidic conditions. Um, so. The, the, the waters that were there, and this, this goes back to the landing of the Opportunity rover back in uh, 2004, and, and they discovered these, I don't know if you heard, these blueberries, these, these, these features that, were, that we thought uh, told us that the, the waters that were involved were very acidic in nature, so low pH in nature. And so um, in order to do our research back here in the laboratory, what we did is we set up a series of laboratory experiments trying to understand how low pH or acidic waters would influence the nature of the materials that we would be working with. So in one laboratory we, we made Martian basalt and then in another laboratory we then took that Martian basalt and interacted it with these acidic waters and then looked at the products and then with, from the products you then say, okay, how do those products compare with what we see on Mars and is that, is that a sensible model or do we have to do a different experiment to come up with a different model and so we did that we spent a lot of time doing that we spent many years doing that but then uh, over time we've begun to realize or at least we, we now understand that that earlier in the history of Mars that the conditions were actually more complicated that it wasn't just low pH acidic uh, waters that there was all kinds of different waters and so now we're just and then this has really come from the Curiosity, Curiosity rover work and so now what we're doing is we're trying to think about new experiments and new ways of looking at how we would interact the basaltic materials with the, with the different kinds of waters and then see what the products are and then again make the comparisons. Okay. Uh, what is it like working with a rover on Mars? Uh, it's challenging. Uh, so the, 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 uh, um, for most you know, for many spacecraft, uh, they, they orbit or they, or they land, but they, 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 and, um, and so, so making plans is, is not that hard, frankly. You, mm -hmm. you know, you, you tell the orbiter, well, I want to take pictures here, here, and here, and you can lay it out, you know, for, you know, days and even weeks ahead of you. Rovers are different because rovers move, and so rovers have to be attended to almost every single day. So with the rovers, um, uh, not every day, but most days, if the rover moves or if it, uh, if it wants to make a, you know, a, 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 any kind of measurement that requires motion, you need to have photographs you know, to make sure it's safe. You, if it wants to use its arm, you don't want it to bang into a rock. If you want it to drive, you don't want it to drive over a cliff, off a cliff. So, mm -hmm. so you always have to have pictures. And, and so each day you have to you know, examine what the rover has done before you can plan what it's going to do you know, on the next day. So when you're involved with the operations of the rover, uh, what will happen typically is that on, if the rover has moved, either driven somewhere or it's used one of its, its arm or something, then it will send back images. And then we have to evaluate those images, make sure things are safe, uh, most importantly, and then try to get an understanding of what's in our immediate surroundings and then on the basis of that, make a plan to either uh, take pictures of something or to put the arm out and make a measurement on something and ultimately to actually drill a sample and take the sample and put it into the rover, into the instruments that are inside the rover. And so when you're doing operations, it's a very grueling, you know, it's, it takes a whole day, you're, you know, you're tied up pretty much for the whole day. Uh, early in the mission, for the first, uh, in, in the case of uh, Spirit and Opportunity, I think it was for six months or more, almost nine months, and for Curiosity, for the first three months, uh, you have to live on what's called Mars time. Mm -hmm. So uh, on Earth Day is 24 hours, as we all know. On Mars, a, a day is 24 hours and 40 minutes. Okay. And so, and the rovers, you know, because it, it's working with, in the case of Spirit and Opportunity, it's solar panels, so it has to use the sun, so it has to live on a Mars day. And in the case of Curiosity, uh, it's just convenient to work on, on the Mars day. So uh, initially we had to go and live on Mars time. So, so today you got up at 9, tomorrow you have to get up at 9.40, the next day you get up at 10.20, and this goes through, cycles through. And that's also very, that was also very challenging. Um, and then at some point you then have to come back and live on Earth time. You can't, you, know, you can't do that indefinitely. And so now what happens is that 
is that you know we, we live on Earth time, but Mars time is moving ahead of us, right? So every day it's moving 40 minutes ahead of us, mm -hmm. and we it takes us like something like 10 hours to make a plan, right? So we get the we get the result down, and then we have 10 hours in order to make the plan and send it up to Mars. So as Mars Mars time drifts away from us, there comes a point that we don't get the information down in time to make the plan. Okay. And so when that happens, you go on what's called restricted time. And so in those cases, you can't plan on the basis of what you got yesterday. You have to plan on the basis of what you got two days ago. And so, so you then make two-day plans instead of one-day plans. And, and that lasts for, in the case of, um, of opportunity, that, that's like, one third of the time, in the case of curiosity, it's about half the time that you, you do that. So then it's not it doesn't take quite as much time. You only have to plan every second day. So so that's just some of the complexities. And so, but it's very exciting. I mean, uh, when you think about it, if you have, if you have any job, right? It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you have any job, and every day, it, what you're going to face is brand new. Right? It's never been you've never done it before. You've never seen it before. You know, that, that's just exciting. That's just interesting. And so so that's working with the rovers is kind of like that. Every day is something new. Which rover did you prefer working with? The opportunity or curiosity? Oh boy, that's like asking which child you prefer most. <laughs> um, so when I when I first started, uh, the first rover I worked on was Spirit. So when okay. when I went initially, Spirit landed first. Opportunity landed a couple weeks later. Uh, but I, for my own, you know, from what I was interested in, I thought that Spirit would would be doing working in rocks that I was most interested mm -hmm. in. So I started working with Spirit, but. Uh, within a month, within well, within within a, actually within le within a month of Spirit landing, in less than two weeks of Opportunity landing, it was very clear that that wasn't right. It was the other way around. So then I mostly worked on Opportunity uh, for, for for that mission and have worked mo now. Spirit's no longer working, but mm -hmm. but for you know for most of that mission, I worked on Opportunity, uh, and then um, but over time, the, the the capabilities of Opportunity have diminished. So. So, for example, one of its instruments required a radioactive source that had a short half-life, and so it no longer works because the, the radioactive source is no longer no longer working. Uh, you know, and it's got arthritic aspects to it. You know, <laughs> things don't work, and you know, slow down, and you know, other you know, one instrument that, you know just broke, mm -hmm. and so it, it's still still great. It still has fabulous results, but it doesn't have quite the capabilities of of Curiosity, and so right now. Um, I mean, I love them both dearly, but, but Curiosity is just getting more data and, you know, it just has so much more capability that uh, most of my effort is, 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 is involved with, with uh, Curiosity, but I will, I will stick with Opportunity until it's no longer <laughs> which, I mean, it's gone almost, it's gone 11 years now, so who knows how long it will go, so. Will there be another rover? Yes, there is a uh, there is a rover planned for uh, 2020. Uh, it's called at the moment it's called Mars 2020. It will get a name. Usually, they put a competition out to young people, like like yeah. kid, high school kids, yep. to come up with their names, and that and I'm sure they'll do something like that again. Uh, Stony Brook actually is heavily involved in in Mars 2020. Uh, one of the other professors here, Joel Hurwitz, he's the deputy principal investigator of one of the instruments that was selected for Mars 2020. So. Yeah. Last year they selected, I think it was 10 instruments, and one of those is called Pixel. It's a, it, it's, it's on the, it'll be on the arm, and it will, it will take uh, geochemical maps of the surface. So, okay. on, you know, on about the size of a, you know, I don't know, the size of a, you know, a, a, a few inches by, a couple of inches by a couple of inches, mm -hmm. and it will make geochemical maps of, of that surface. Um, and uh, so it's very exciting because we will, he will, he will set up a research program here at Stony Brook related to that, that, that instrument because there's a, a great deal of work that has to be done to calibrate it, to learn how it works and all that kind of stuff. So there'll be lots of opportunities here at Stony Brook for students and others to get involved in that kind of stuff. So, That's awesome. We're, yeah, we're very excited about that. Yeah. Mm. I'm out of questions. <laughs> I was going to ask, um, <clears throat> When do you think we'll be, what do you, do you think we will ever be able to live on Mars? Sure. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's down the road a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there are, there are a number, there, there, there's, I mean, the, the, 
the current plan of the federal government is ultimately to colonize, at least to visit and then in due course mm -hmm. colonize mm -hmm. Mars. Uh, how that will happen and when that will happen, I think, is, is, is still to some degree up in the air. Um, we, we need to, for example, uh, return samples from Mars at some point so we can put them into our laboratories to make sure that there's no uh, environmental issues, that there's no possibility of contamination, you know, you know, you know um, biological contamination mm -hmm. either way. So you have to, there's international treaties about contaminating other planets with, you know, with back, uh, microbial life from Earth and that kind of thing. So we'll have to get samples back and that will take a while. Uh, you know, perhaps we'll send people in into orbit first. Mm -hmm. um, if we go to Mars and we put people on Mars, there's, it's not clear whether whether they will uh, go visit and come back or whether they will colonize just like the pilgrims colonized America. Mm -hmm. You go and you don't come back. Uh, if they do that, that will of course require a tremendous amount of uh, resources to, to keep people there. Um, so I, you know, I think, and, and, and also if you have people on Mars for any extended period of time, you do have to figure out a way for them to get some of the resources mm -hmm. from Mars. You know, they have to get their water, uh, maybe some of their energy, things like that. So, so uh, you know, in due course, of course, uh, but when? That's, that's just not clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Mm -hmm. And I think one other uh, thing that's of interest uh, is this whole business of life detection, right? So there's right. One, one of the mm -hmm. uh, one of the things, another thing that we're uh, that I've been working on, and um, uh, has you know this whole business of, of of whether or not there's life on Mars. And so one of the plans is, is to ultimately get samples back from Mars. And, and that, the Mars 2020 rover, some people hope will be the first, um, the first of, of what will be three missions that's needed to do that. So, uh, so the, the 2020 rover, in addition to doing all kinds of exciting science on its own, uh, it's also, there's also a plan that it will collect samples and put them into a cache some kind of a cache, so mm -hmm. it will drill samples. Um, they're about they'll be about 15 grams each. They'll be shaped like a small tube, mm -hmm. and then they will lay them onto the sur. They'll collect as many as they think are uh, that they can mm -hmm. manage. Lay them onto the surface somewhere. Then the 2020 rover, when it finishes that, can go off and do whatever it pleases. You know, the science that it wants to do. Then another mission has to come uh, at another time, and the earliest would be. A, you can go to Mars about every 26 months. That, that's right. that, okay. just the way the orbits go. So, so on Mars, you know, every two years, just over every two years, it, the, the configuration is such that you can get there without spending too much fuel and mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. like that. So 20, as early as 26 months later, you could send another spacecraft, and its job would be to go and collect those samples. And then come back. And, well, the, 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 you, you, you can't carry a rocket that's big enough to send them back to Earth right away, right? So you would then collect the samples with a small rocket. That rocket would then put the samples into orbit around Mars, and it would sit, they'd sit in orbit around Mars in a container about the size of a basketball, mm -hmm. maybe a bit smaller, soccer ball maybe. And then two years after that, you send yeah, another, another mission that's an orbiting mission that comes along and it captures that thing in orbit, and then comes that back. comes back. That's right. Another that two back. years? And then, well, it it would take it would take about six or seven months to get oh, them back. Okay. So not so bad. But it, it's it's a long, drawn out process, yeah. and um, and people are very excited about that. And the feeling is that it will always be hard to prove whether or not there's either present day life, which a lot of people think is less likely, or fossil life, like evidence of ancient life. Mm -hmm. And it will be very hard to prove that with instruments that you take to Mars. But if you get the samples back, then you can start to put them into the very best laboratories of the world. Put them onto Brookhaven, for example, you know, the, the, you know, the very best, mm -hmm. most sophisticated laboratories in the world. And that's when you'll really answer that question, whether or not there was either life now or ever was life in the past. So that's, that's another thing that we've been involved with here at Stony Brook, is helping to set up the plans for that, that kind of, those kinds of missions. So. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, Mars is cool. Mars is very yeah, cool. Very <laughs> Would you ever go to Mars? Would I ever go to Mars? Mm, I get a little bit odd. <laughs> uh, there, there, there is no shortage of, of finding people to, that would go to Mars. Even if you tell them it's a one-way trip. There's oh. a, an organization, I think they're centered in Europe somewhere. Mm -hmm. 
and called Mars One, I believe is the name. And, I think and so. you heard of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're 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 trying to put together a private enterprise mission to be able to that will send people to Mars. Uh -huh. One way a, trip. A one way trip, and apparently the list of people who've offered to go is not short. It is yeah. a very long list. Wow. I feel like at a certain point in your life, you can just go. Yeah. Like, why not? Probably do it. <laughs> I'd probably do it. Maybe yeah. not now, but yeah, I think you might want. Yeah, I, I would be. The thing about doing it with with governments, you know, they'll they'll make an investment and a commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens if the private enterprise goes out of business, right? Yeah. What, what happens then? So, uh, but you know, they they'll 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 work. There, there are other you know what an interesting thing is that uh, not just for Mars, but in general, there is just increasingly more. Uh, uh, organizations that are in the private, mm -hmm. you know, either, either non-profits or for-profits that are getting into into space exploration, and that's great because because it frees up NASA to do the more expo you know, exploration kinds mm -hmm. of stuff, and you can leave the you know the things that we know how to do, like you know moving uh, moving um, uh, um, you know food and, and 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 stuff like that to the to you know to space stations and you know, that that stuff we know how to do and so you know give that off to the private enterprise yeah. and, and let NASA That's focus coming up more stuff yeah with with new new and exciting stuff so yeah all right well, thank you very much thank you this is my pleasure my pleasure nice to hear very open Eyes. Yeah, yeah. Hope it's a whole different world. Yeah, yeah. well, a, lots of good stuff going on here at Starbucks, and, and in the prime. And we're not only interested, you know, doing Mars and Mars related stuff, but but uh, a colleague next door, he's interested in he's working on lunar missions, and oh. uh, you know, we're interested in all kinds of stuff related to um, the planetary science and space exploration. So, lots of stuff going on here. Yeah. All right. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Well, Thank good you. luck with your uh, with your project and.